You're listening to the Break It Down podcast. This is a special episode. Today's episode sounds a little different as the Managing Director for Nigeria Health Watch speaks with Dr. Magda Rubalo of the Institute of Global Health and Development on how a strengthened public health workforce can contribute to Africa's health security agenda. Episode four is one of two podcasts focused on the Conference on Public Health in Africa, CPHIA, which is taking place in Lusaka, Zambia, between the 27th and 30th of November this year. The CPHIA provides a unique African-led platform for leaders across the continent to reflect on lessons learned in health and science and align on a way forward for creating a more resilient health system across the continent. This year, Nigeria Health Watch is proud to be an official media partner and we will be hosting two side events at the conference in Lusaka. Registration is open now, so please register on cphia.com or nigeriahealthwatch.com. Okay, with me today, I have Dr. Magda Robalo, who is the president and co-founder, Institute for Global Health and Development. Really pleased to have you with us today, Dr. Magda. Perhaps maybe you can also, you know, introduce yourself that way. Our audience knows a bit about you. Thank you so much, um, Vivian and uh, Nigeria Health Watch, for this opportunity. My name is Magda Robalo. I'm a medical doctor by profession, and uh, I'm currently the uh, president of the Institute for Global Health and Development, uh, Guinea-Bissau based nonprofit working to advance gender equality, sustainable financing effective governance and um, uh, knowledge uh, economy. Thank you very much for that introduction. This podcast is part of Nigeria Health Watch's Break It Down podcast, which we use to engender engagement and awareness around various health issues. And also we use it as a way to inform our listeners so that they also are better equipped, advocate for better health care for themselves, for their communities and for their families. So today we're here to talk about the importance of a health workforce. The title for this podcast is How a Strengthened Public Health Workforce Can Contribute to Africa's Health Security Agenda. I think all of us learned so much from the lessons from COVID-19, especially how um, frontline health workers are critical for our collective public health security. And this podcast. We're also recording it because we have in end of November, the third edition of the Conference on Public Health in Africa. And one of the tracks for this is delivering universal health coverage in Africa and strengthened and equity, equitable health systems. And I think the topic of our discussion today fits in really, really well with that track theme, as well as some of the others where, you know, our health workforce is really critical. So I'm going to start and ask just a few few questions and, you know, we'll have a you know general discussion about why we think a strong public health workforce is critical for our own collective um, health security. So starting, first question I want to ask is, Dr. Magda, why do you think it's essential to work towards um, strengthening health security, really, for Africa's development? Vivian, I think um, without health security, there is no development. We have seen recently, with the example of the COVID-19 pandemic, that All sectors of human development can be shaken and brought down by uh, a pandemic that uh, devastated um, our economies, devastated our health systems. So without health security, you can't think development. It is important, therefore, to prepare for effective responses to future threats because we know there will continue to be uh, risks and threats to to our health security uh, in order to avoid uh, the devastating impact we have seen with COVID-19 it is important to invest 
uh, on preparedness um, so that uh, we no longer see uh, a, a situation like uh, like we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic, health security is paramount and preparedness for resilient health security is uh, the order of the day. Thank you for that. Um, I especially like how you mentioned that we have to remain prepared um, and building a resilient health um, security architecture is really critical for, you know, our own um, protection um, and for that of our wider communities. Now, touching on um, one of the key themes, I think, that came out of, um, you know, the pandemic and lessons learned was we saw the need for really strong public health institutes and leadership we saw from Africa CDC was really critical in that. And from that, you know, heads of state and governments of the African Union called at this for a the full implementation of Africa's new public health order. And in order to achieve this, one of the things that they mentioned was a strengthened public health work- workforce. Why do you think this is really an important part of their strategy for this new public health order? Africa CDC and the African Union have been uh, really uh, demonstrating exemplary leadership when it comes to designing and showing the way forward for Africa's health security. With the adoption of the new public health order for Africa back in 2021 uh, with its five pillars, we have seen a roadmap which will take us to a better future, to, which will take us to uh, health systems which will be robust enough to withstand shocks that dare to occur. The, the pillar on strengthened um, health workforce is one of the most critical uh, and which will enable all the other pillars to actually uh, be implemented. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because the human capital is at the center of everything we do. If we don't have competent, motivated, well-remunerated, capable health workforce, there is no health security for anyone. There will be no vaccines, diagnostics, and um, medicines for anyone. There will be no health systems, if I can put it that way. You can throw millions of dollars on a health system to, to in order to provide uh, the vaccines that children need, the medicines that uh, patients need. But you need human beings to provide the care to distribute those vaccines and to manage those, uh, those systems, the health centers and the institutions that constitute the health system. Without human beings, without health workers, it is just not possible. But we are not just talking about human beings. We are talking about health workers who are well-trained, who are well-paid, who have very good working conditions, who are motivated to uh, provide the services, who are competent to in terms of the, the responsibilities they are given, sometimes or many times, we don't have the right person at the right place. Uh, all that is part of uh, a strong health workforce, which will catalyze and dynamize the uh, new public health order so that the public health institutions are strong. Uh, again, here you may have beautiful uh, buildings, but what makes uh, um, public health institutions strong is the man and the woman who leads uh, them. And um, uh, you can say the same for any other um, element of the, um, uh, any other pillar of the uh, new public health order. The shortage we are observing uh, in terms of um, healthcare workers is uh, undermining our ability to build uh, a resilient health systems and to build our health security. Okay. I think, you know, we have touched upon a lot of issues, Dr. Magda, and I think some of them we experienced during the pandemic. And, you know, you're very right when you say without a health workforce, we cannot build health systems and we cannot achieve the health security that we need 
for our different countries. But in addition, we always often sometimes overlook the need to have a well-motivated and well-remunerated health workforce. I think one of the things we all collectively understood is women account for a large percent of the health workforce, often voluntary, but we know to keep them motivated, to keep their families going, and to keep them also well-trained, building the necessary skills they need to be well remunerated. And I think we need to keep on reiterating that element because sometimes I think we we do focus too much on, you know, the voluntary part of some of these frontline health workers without realizing that they too need um, support and need their livelihoods supported in, you know, carrying out their work. You so, are so, absolutely yes, right. Absolutely right. Um, I'm sure you have, me. from your experience in, um, you know, leading the COVID-19 response, you encountered many health workers who, you know, put themselves really on the front line. And this new public health order, focusing on that as a critical pillar, I think amplifies that. And collectively, we need to really advocate for, really advocate for our health workers who we cannot do without. You mentioned the the need to remunerate, but from your perspective, what other key challenges do you see that kind of stop us or limit us from building that robust public health work, workforce across Africa, really, to address and to strengthen our collective health security? Mm. Um, I totally agree um, with the points you raised about um, women being uh, the majority of um, the health care workforce. In most countries, particularly in low and middle income countries, we unfortunately see that they constitute um, the majority of um, uh, those who are underpaid or not paid at all. Uh, I'm specifically talking about community health workers who work as volunteers, and this is a, uh, an element that needs to be addressed. But what uh, has been the, um, uh, the, the weak link uh, probably the weakest link in terms of having motivated healthcare workforce is the fact that the budgets dedicated to health are still remaining very small, inadequate for addressing the needs and the priorities of the health systems. Uh, You may recall that it was in Abuja, Nigeria, uh, that our heads of state adopted the Uh, now famous um, Abuja declaration about allocating 15% of the national budgets to the health sector. But unfortunately, very few countries have committed the share of their budgets commensurate to the Abuja declaration. And uh, very few countries are actually honoring that commitment. The vast majority of our countries are not funding the health systems of their countries to the tune of our ambition, to the tune of their priorities, to the tune of the needs. And therefore, you will see countries where the entire health budget goes to pay health workers miserable salaries, which doesn't allow them to uh, live a decent life, um, educate their children, send them to school, and be able to go to work with uh, peace of mind, uh, discharge their duties, and then go back home because they know uh, probably there is not enough food at home. They have school fees to pay. Uh, they need to care for the family, etc. So until the time, we will have adequate resources dedicated to finance the health systems, including having career paths within the health system, because it's not money alone, but it's also the opportunities of being promoted. It's the opportunities to lead. For example, we have just mentioned that majority of healthcare workers are women, but women don't see themselves reaching the leadership positions they deserve. That's also a factor for demotivation. It's not, motivation is not just money. It's not just about pecuniary remuneration. It is also about 
reaching career level that you deserve, it is also about having working conditions that are conducive for you to provide the care and the services as you have learned in uh, medical or nursing schools. Very often, more often than not, our health systems, our health facilities don't have running water, don't have electricity, don't have minimum standards that will really give satisfaction to healthcare workers for their to discharge their duties. So these are um, a package of elements that really need to be carefully looked at. Uh, When you think about social amenities for um, healthcare workers to uh, take care of their families and make sure that the children uh, are going to school. Think about sending uh, people to remote rural areas. We know that the majority of our health workers are concentrated in urban areas because the rural areas don't provide uh, the, the school they need for the children, the electricity, the internet they need for, for themselves and for the children. So it is um, a, an entire package that comes along for which uh, multi-sector collaboration within governments need to be put in place because the ministries of health cannot resolve these problems. You need the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Social Equipment, you need infrastructures uh, that are uh, maintained and adequate for delivering health services, you need water, sanitation, etc. Uh, in social protection uh, so that um, the healthcare workers have the conducive environment for them to deliver the services, the quality of services that they are supposed to do. I want to insist on the world quality of services because, again, here, we are still far from providing the level of quality of services that our people deserve. Uh, And there is a lot to be done in that front. But fortunately, um, increasingly, we are seeing uh, African um, healthcare workers, African innovators, African scientists coming up with options, with solutions, with uh, breakthrough uh, innovations that can really help the continent to leapfrog towards the, uh, the, the, the health care of the 21st century that we need for our populations. Thank you so much, Dr. Magda. I mean, there is so much to unpack in what you've said, and I really, you know, wish we have, we know, We'd love to have you know much longer time to to discuss this, but there's so many things you touched upon. I mean, you mentioned you know the famous Abuja Declaration that we talk about every single time about how heads of state committed you know 15 percent in Nigeria. We haven't reached up to six percent of our budget on health, and you can imagine with a population of over 200 million and growing, what challenges um, that poses. And these declarations are important because it shows you know a willingness to do things, but We also saw a recent declaration um, during the UN General Assembly, the high level, during the high level meetings on pandemic prevention and preparedness and response where countries pledged, you know, declared that they will commit to ensuring that future health security is safeguarded. And we feel in that is a lot of things that you mentioned. Health workers are the fulcrum around which we need to deliver health um, security and making sure we have motivated health workers who work in communities or in the urban areas with amenities, the social infrastructure to support their families is central and critical. Um, You also talked about the need for multi-sectoral collaboration. We always look at health security as the purview of the health sector, but you're very right in terms of ministries of finance, um, ministry of water resources, infrastructure, all of these are critical. But there are also other um, stakeholders that are important for health security. So partnerships with NGOs, academia. What kind of role do you think these other stakeholders can play in enhancing, for instance, the skills of you know, the public health professionals in supporting them and some of the capacity on move at that gaps that they may have? And also, you mentioned leadership. A lot of health workers do not see themselves as getting to that leadership position especially women, um, that role is often denied. How do you think we can move forward in this strengthening, not just of the capability, but also in motivation, but providing them with the necessary support to get to that place where they now are in the driving seat to make some of those critical decisions that affect their lives? 
Yes, um, Vivian, that's a very critical um, component. Um, the, the ministries of health cannot uh, do it alone, and health needs to be increasingly seen as um, a, a multi-sectoral department um, rather than just a, a vertical uh, ministry uh, which is led uh, by uh, a minister. Uh, governments need to increasingly uh, bring other sectors uh, Every sector is important to health. Some are more important, and increasingly, governments need to see the Ministry of Health as just um, uh, a coordinator of a sector that has multiple um, uh, contributors to. And um, in terms of um, how can we take women to uh, move beyond the current uh, middle level and uh, low level positions within the health sector, uh, there are many barriers to be dismantled. And uh, we know that um, uh, it takes uh, time uh, to change that, but we need sense of urgency. We need to uh, let um, those in power know that uh, for too long it has been a status quo that can no longer be tolerated. And dismantling the barriers mean acknowledging that things are not the way they should be, and the rules that keep women in low or middle level positions need to be changed. Uh, promotion to careers, uh, to high senior positions, to leadership positions should not be decided by men which uh, are the majority of those leading, the majority of those making decisions. So if the, um, the decision-making uh, um, platforms are not changed, we will continue to see garbage in, garbage out. It will continue to be the same. So we need to challenge those stereotypes. We need to challenge those uh, systems that have been in place forever and give women the opportunity to lead because they know they are competent, they have experience, and they have leadership capabilities. Uh, but that takes um, more than just government. It takes uh, uh, parliaments. It takes civil society, it takes private sector, it takes um, communities to fight for dismantling the barriers that are preventing women from leading. Even if, um, uh, when I mention communities, I, I, I want to say that these stereotypes start at home. They start in society before they get entrenched into our ministries and our decision power uh, institutions. So it is at home, it's within our communities that we need to start dismantling those barriers, sending the girl child to school, empowering them and making them believe that them too, they can lead. Uh, dividing uh, responsibilities at home, go fetch water, clean, cook, between um, boys and girls. And this is what moms and aunties need to start doing at home so that when we come to uh, government institutions, those barriers are already being challenged and women are more confident to fight for what they deserve. And men are also more amenable to understand that things are not like in our parents' time. I am um, I'm, um, optimistic because I think I'm seeing a new generation of um, boys and girls, women and men, who think differently about uh, the relationships of power between uh, genders. And I want to believe that we are poised to be in a better future, but we need to continue to fight and fight harder. We didn't know uh, ministries of health to go back to the health sector that interests us in this conversation. Uh, we really need to revise the, the, the laws. Parliament needs to really focus on that, but then you move into the politics because how many women do you find in our parliaments with voice to influence the change uh, that we need in our laws? Very few. For example, my country just um, uh, held elections past June and we 
went back uh, in terms of gains of women positions in parliament. So we actually elected less women this time than we had before. So these are some of the barriers that are preventing progress, including in the health sector. And we shouldn't be shy uh, of uh, calling off uh, the rules that are preventing women from uh, becoming uh, leaders. We have seen the stagnation in women leadership when it comes to uh, leading delegations to the World Health Assembly. Very few women have been leading delegations to which attended the uh, United Nations General Assembly. So all these are uh, factors that influence what happens in the health sector. We shouldn't see these as separate events or separate um, um Occur occurrences in our systems, uh, they are interlinked and we need to work hard in different sectors. We need to find the lies in all these sectors uh, in order to push forward and uh, bring women to the right place they deserve within the health sector and beyond. Uh, going back to what Africa CDC and the African Union are doing, again, we would like to call upon uh, a more a stronger uh, emphasis on promoting uh, women empowerment and gender balance within the African Union institutions uh, so that we lead by example and we commit, we do what we have committed to do, both uh, with the um, new public health order, but also Agenda 2063 of the African Union. Thank you so much, Dr. Robalo. I think, you know, to kind of sum up, because we're unfortunately running out of time um, from, you know, what you've said, for us, I think, as a continent, to achieve that pillar of, you know, the new public health order, some of the things we need to do is challenge, but also break down some of those social norms you mentioned in terms of how we limit our young girls and women from attaining those leadership positions and how they see themselves as reaching those leadership positions. But in addition, we have to have a whole of society response that encompasses our communities, that encompasses our families, but also a whole of government response that also encapsulates not just the Ministry of Health, but also all the other ministries, departments and agencies that have a critical role to play in us attaining that public health infrastructure and health security architecture that we all aspire to. COVID-19, I think, was a pandemic that was a wake-up call for, for global communities. And I think a lot of lessons have been learned. Let's hope that it's not just about saying lessons learned, but actually we now implement some of those lessons and make things better for the future. So I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Magda, for, for being on this podcast. As I mentioned at the beginning, Dr. Magda Robado is the president and co-founder Institute for Global Health and Development. We're really pleased to have her here on our Break It Down podcast. Thank you very much for this opportunity and we would like to invite uh, everyone to join us in Lusaka for the conference on, third conference on public health in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you.